Hello and welcome to this video in which we will find the discrete time convolution of two discrete time rectangular pulses. So you can see on the uh, screen we've actually got uh, x of k and h of k and both of them are rectangular pulses. Uh, they go between uh, when the values are 0, they're either 0 or 1. And uh, the goal here is to show you how to do the con convolution of these guys. So just to remind you, uh, the reason that we have uh, the variable k here, well, in fact let's back up just a sec, our goal is to compute y of n which is the convolution of x with h. Now this notation is actually misleading because it makes you think perhaps that the sample of y at time n depends only on the sample of x at time n and the sample of h at time n. When in fact the way it really works is it requires the entire set of samples of x and the entire set of samples of h. And the, in particular we're doing the summation from k going from minus infinity to infinity of x of k, h of n minus k. So as we go through this, uh, I'm going to have a k here representing the value that we're using in here for the summation. And uh, we'll actually have a different picture for different values of n. So the way this works is we'll choose a particular value of n and then with that particular value of n we'll figure out what this summation looks like and uh, work it out and that will give us our y of n. Okay, so the thing we need to do, or the first thing we need to do, we notice that this h of n minus k is um, equivalent, again when we're talking about h of k, to flipping h of k about the point n is equal to zero so we'll exchange these two guys, these two guys, and these two guys, and everything else is already zero. In fact, there should be a zero right there. And then shifting it uh, to the right by n if n is positive and to the left by n if n is negative. So when we flip this, we get, or when we flip h of k about the point n equals zero, we get something that looks like this and then for different values of n we'll shift this to the right or left. So let's begin with this case. So here we have n is equal to negative 2 and it turns out that the answer we get in this case will also be the same as when n is less than negative 2. So, um, and I'll explain in just a minute why that's the case. If we look at the situation here when n is equal to negative 2 any times uh, minus 1, 0, and 1 where x of k is non-zero, h of minus 2 minus k is 0. Any uh, points where h of uh, minus 2 minus k is non-zero, x of k is 0. So the product of x of k and h of minus 2 minus k, which is what we need to find to do the summation, uh, this product, every one of these terms is going to be zero. And you can see that if n is less than negative two, uh, that means that I'll shift h of uh, k even farther to the left. And again, there won't be any non-zero overlapping portions between x and h. So for n less than or equal to negative two, I will have the product of every term, or every term in this product will be zero. And since I collect or I compute y by summing all of these terms, that will be 0 as well. So we'll have y of n is equal to 0. Okay, well, that wasn't that bad, right? Turns out convolution is not that bad. In fact, it gets kind of fun once you figure out what you're doing. Okay, so now we look at this. Uh, here, what we have drawn is the case where n is equal to 0. Um, and for the case where n is equal to 0, I have x of k be 0, and so x of k is 0 for uh, values of k less than negative 1, 
which means that any values of h of minus k will get multiplied by 0 as long as k is less than negative 1. So these guys are 0. Similarly, well, up here we have zeros and zeros, so these guys are zeros as well. Okay, and uh, the case where k is equal to 1, we have h of minus k is 0, x of k is 1, so that product is 0. So I could just say for n equals to 0, I'll have uh, 1 here and 1 here, so I'll have y of 0 equals 2. But what I really want to do is also look at the case where n is equal to minus 1. And the reason I'm going to do this, well, I want to look at both of these cases. And the reason is, is that I can set this up as a summation. And it will look strange, and it's kind of the long way to do it. But if we start working with pulses that are much longer than these guys, it will help us see how to set it up. So if I look at this at x of k, for values of k less than negative 1, x of k is 0, which means that when I'm computing y of n using the summation k going from minus infinity to infinity, x of k, h of n minus k, well, that's kind of messy. So for any value of k, less than negative 1, x of k is going to be 0. So any term that's got a 0, well, any value of n or k, I'm sorry, any value of k for which x is 0 means that the product's going to be 0. So I can just take that out of the summation. So I can actually cross this out and say that this is um, a lower limit of minus 1. Similarly, if I look at the picture I have here, if n is 0, as I've drawn it here, then anything above n is 0. And so the product for anything above um, 0 is also 0, so those terms don't show up in the summation. If n is negative 1, then I would actually have zeros to the right of this squiggly line I've just drawn. So basically here, I can replace this upper limit of infinity with n, okay? Because again, h of n minus k is going to have um, uh, between uh, minus 1 and 0, h of n minus k is going to be 0 for values of k greater than n. And so if I do that, between these two limits, I have x of k equal to 1 and h equal to 1. So I have 1 times 1. So this just becomes the summation k going from negative 1 to n of 1. Okay. So if n is equal to minus 1, so this would be 1 when n is equal to negative 1, and it would be 2 when n is equal to 0. And let's see if I were smart. I could probably figure out an expression that involves just n. And let's see, that would be, um, well, say 2 minus, no, 2 plus n. That gives me uh, these values whenever n is between 0 and negative 1. Okay, well, um, hopefully that made sense. Again, this is really kind of the hard way to do it, but we're doing it this way because um, this approach, uh, finding where the front end of h of minus k begins to overlap the back end of x of k, allows us to write this in a summation. And then for more general situations, that is where we have much longer pulses, I can do the same thing. OK. Well, let's look at the next case. OK, so now we have the case, I've drawn the case where n is equal to 2. And um, this will actually work for the situations where n is equal to 1 or n is equal to 2 
or n is equal to 3. Okay. So the idea is I look at my at the relationship between x and h. When n is equal to 1, I would have h going from minus 3 to 1. The way I've drawn it, I have h going from minus 2 to 2. And if n were 3, I'd have h going from minus 1 to 3. But in, in any case, the um, non-zero portion of h completely overlaps the non-zero portion of x. So that um, these three terms at minus 1, 0, and 1 uh, in the product are 1. And so in this case, y is going to be uh, the summation from k going from minus 1 to 1, because y of k in this case is setting the limits of the summation. It tells us where um, the zeros end and the ones start, and then it tells us where the ones end and the zeros start again. And again, between uh, k going from minus 1 to 1, x of k is 1, h of n minus k is 1. So this just turns out to be 3. I have 1 plus 1 plus 1. OK, so far so good. Um, let's see. So now we have the situation where n is larger. Uh, so we can say, uh, let's say n is equal to 4 or n is equal to 5 where now h of n minus k has moved so far to the right that um, the trailing edge of h is starting to run into the non-zero values of x. And you can see here for the case where n is equal to 4, uh, I have an overlap that goes from, or I have overlapping at 0 and 1. So these terms at k is equal to 0 and k is equal to 1 will be non-zero. So I can write this y of n is the summation k going from this point here, which is, um, what, n minus 4 up to 1. Okay. And um, again, the k goes in from n minus 4. This will be um, 0 when n is 4 and 1 when n is 5. And again, it's representing the trailing edge here. And we're going up to 1 because the leading edge of x of k uh, tells us where that ends. And here, this is 1 times 1. So it's going to be however many terms are in the summation, which I can write as um, 1 minus n minus 4 plus 1. Um, which gives me, um, let's see, what does that give me? Uh, 4, that's not right, that gives me 6. I'm having a real hard time with basic math, 6 minus n. So that tells me what y of n is here. And finally, I have the situation where the non-zero portions of x and h no longer overlap at all. And so this would be the case where n is greater than or equal to, um, and I think I got this wrong. This should be, this guy here should be 6. So this is n greater than or equal to 6. y of n will be 0. OK. Well, I'm almost out of time, but let's summarize really quickly what we ended up with. Okay, so here we have the two signals we're, con or we're convolving. If I draw then y of n, and now I'm going to use n as an index, between, um, or for n less than or equal to negative 2, y is 0. So let's see if we have negative 2. So we have zeros like this. For n between 0 and 1, we'll have 2 plus n. So 2 plus negative 1 is 1. 2 plus 0 is 2. 
and this again is 0, minus 1, and so on. For n equal 1, 2, or 3, we'll have y of n is 3. So we have 1, 2, or 3. For n equal to 4 or 5, we'll have y of n is equal to 6 minus n. Okay, so 6 minus 4 is 2. 6 minus 5 is 1. And for n greater than 5, greater than or equal to 6, we'll have 0. So there you have it. We've convolved two rectangular pulses. We've done it in a sort of complicated way with the understanding that hopefully if I were to give you pulses that were longer you could look at what we've done here and figure out how to generalize it to longer pulses. So I hope this has been helpful. Thanks for watching.